Um, great pleasure today to have with us Debbie Womack from Triumph Pilgrimages. Thanks so much for having for coming onto our show, Debbie. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and share with you guys. And our lovely co-host is Kelly, and Kelly is our voiceover artist, and you'll know Kelly by her voice. How are you, Kelly? Good. How are y'all doing this today? Well, I know it's not evening for all of you, but it's evening for me. <laughs> yeah, it's morning here in Australia. Let us yeah. start with a prayer. Kelly, would you like to say a Hail Mary? For, uh, just Absolutely. Off? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 So encourage people not to fear what's going on in the world. I mean, the, what's going to go on in the world is going to go on in the world, right? But your life can be full and rich and adventurous. Like Father Michael Scanlon used to always tell us, catch the wave of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, you know? Mm -hmm. And Blessed Mother in Medjugorje said, pray every day, dear children, for the Holy Spirit. For when mm -hmm. you have the Holy Spirit, you have everything. And isn't that the truth, you know? That's and, right. and, and, mm -hmm. and, and your life takes on... It takes on so many beautiful avenues and, and turns and 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 joy and and just pure delight in the Lord because you see the conversions that are happening around you. You see that something you say to somebody you don't know, but it comes back, you know, a year later they might come by, you might run into them again and they say, you know, something you said to me really changed my life. You know, we don't know how God wants to use us, but he does want to use us. And he has to use us, and we have to bring the the we have to bring faith, hope, and charity into the world. But we also can bring joy and peace into the world. And I and I would say, for me, the greatest message of Medjugorje is one of hope. The, the it's it's hope. There's like Our Lady has come. The visionaries all got married. The visionaries all had children. Three of them now are grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's so many beautiful things, and they focus on that. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to get all bogged down in the secrets and this and that. And they're like, yeah. well, you know, what, what, God's in control. What are you worried about? You know, have your heart right. Have, have your heart, you know, go to confession at least monthly. Go to daily mass if you can. And if not, find ways in, in the day to unite yourself with the mass and, and find ways in the day to make spiritual communions. If you can't go to communion, uh, read your scriptures because Jesus is there. You know, if you don't, if, uh, what does it say? There's a St. Jerome that says lack of, um, if you don't read the scripture, you don't mm. know the Lord, you know. So I know I didn't say that correctly. But, um, lack of knowledge of the scriptures is lack of knowledge of Christ. Christ. Doesn't it like that? Christ, yeah. Yes. You know, and fasting. So fasting, Our Lady asks us to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, strictly on bread and water. But for those who can't, and it seems like the majority of people can't mm. for for various reasons that they they've come up with, um, yeah, that uh, it's too hard. It's too hard. But Jesus told us in the scriptures, you know, some of these things can only be be um, mm. removed by prayer, prayer, mm. prayer and fasting. Mm. So Our Lady knew way back when, you know, she said, with fasting, prayer and fasting, you can stop war and avert natural disasters. Who would ever believe the kind of natural disasters that that would come in the future? Mm. Right? That that mm. we think. Uh, no matter where we are, who would know, you know, that there would be these crazy wars and, and just this madness in the world, right? So she knew, and she was warned. She said, I am the queen of peace. The king of peace has sent me to help you. <laughs> now we know why. Mm -hmm. Now we can see very clearly, okay, I'm going to cooperate with you, Blessed Mother, because your plan is perfect because it comes from God. She can't be here out of his will. It's impossible. Right. And um, God, God has a, a, a perfect way for us. Scripture tells us that, too, for everything that we're, you know, we're confronted with. There's a way that the Lord has for us to, you know, get through it. Um, she, her peace plan from heaven. She has said mm -hmm. twice in Medjugorje, what I began in Fatima, I will complete in Medjugorje. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And how many people that were very devoted to Fatima didn't want to hear about Medjugorje? But now you're seeing a shift and you're seeing things change. Our Lady asks us to pray every day for unbelievers and not, you know, that's just an English translation of what her meaning was. But her meaning was pray for those who've not yet come to know the love of God. And even mm. know 
it, it may not even just Christians as well who, who don't know absolutely. Christ yet absolutely. haven't had experiences haven't absolutely. experienced Christ in their lives mm -hmm. yeah uh, Debbie you also have pilgrimages at the moment now you're starting pilgrimages to Garabandal yes. can you tell us um, what inspired you to to make that pilgrimage as well I first went to Garabandal in 1999, and uh, you know I think that the messages are very clear. I believe that every apparition site is a signpost leading to Medjugorje, because Medjugorje is, I mean, think of what a great act of divine mercy it is, that Our Lady, that the Lord is sending her. She, she tells us all the time she's here because he sent her. Like she can't come out of God's will, and every day the Lord opens heaven and allows her to descend, mm -hmm. right? And Garabandal, um, there, there are, there's a religious community there called, in English, it's called Home of the Mother. And the sisters and the, and the brothers and some of the priests are here in our diocese. So I've gotten to know them pretty well. And mm -hmm. um, they, they, <laughs> they've asked me, I tried to do this in 2020 and we had to cancel the Garabandal port. You know, we had to cancel all the pilgrimages in 2020 because of COVID. Uh, so sisters, they were after me um, in De December and January. Why did you do Garabandal? And I'm like, okay. So it all worked out. Um, because I think Garabandal, we're getting to a point where that message is going to be um, mm. become more and more known yeah. um, because of the events that will take place. And, and people will realize, uh, again, there's another message of hope. You know, God's mm. giving us mm. way if, if, you're, if you're in a state of grace and the illumination of conscience comes, you can be okay. <laughs> so the most important thing is to focus on your own personal holiness mm -hmm. so yeah. that none of these things should frighten anyone. And if you're frightened by any of this, you really need to take a good, you know, long, hard look at why you're afraid and then get that straightened out with the Lord. Mm -hmm. you know, spend a lot of time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people that are afraid, they they also have um, a lot of some skeptic, skepticism as well. So uh, it's kind of like um, mixed in together, isn't it? Be people that accuse us of fear mongering say, you know, fear mongering. Uh, you know, we shouldn't talk about these things. What what do you say to these skeptics or these people? I, I well, first of all, you realize um, the ones that are they're not they're not really open to hearing the truth because they only want to believe what so-and-so said, but they're not being fair to themselves and looking at the other side to say, okay, where did this person get this information? And has this person, like from Medjugorje example, mm. have they been to Medjugorje? No. So how do they speak so negatively about something they've never experienced? Seeing that the fruit of Medjugorje has, mm -hmm. done, has transformed not only millions of lives, but look how many priests have entered the priesthood and how many women have entered mm. the convents yeah. because, um, you know, because of, of receiving that call in Medjugorje. I received the call to become a secular Franciscan in 1990 there. Um, mm. and, and that's, you know, and there again, then you also have lay orders, you know, people involved in, in, in the lay communities of religious orders. Um, I, I think to, I would just say to be fair to themselves, they need to look deeply at the other side to say, okay, I don't want to believe this kind of shady, <laughs> um, mm. uh, negative, you know, where this negativity comes from. Some of it I know from the past, um, being involved in this as long as I have. Um, and I know how some of it started and it was just out of ego, egoism for some of them. And they mm. were just so upset that they were told that they couldn't do something in Medjugorje that they thought they wanted to do. They went on a rampage. And a lot of people now are quoting from these sources. And it's like, go to Medjugorje and find out for yourself. But if you can't mm -hmm. go to Medjugorje, at least read, like read My Heart Will Triumph, read some of the writings of the priests and, and, and look at the conversions that have taken place. We will know them by their fruit. And the fruit of Medjugorje has been phenomenal. Um, you know, the, the, um, there are plenty of things you can go online, um, listen to Father Leon mm -hmm. uh, Pereira from the Dominican that's in Medjugorje. He speaks very, very clearly um, about and articulately about the those naysayers. And, and mm -hmm. how I've seen one of his recent videos about that as well. Yeah. Yes, and, and on, so I think it's Mary TV. Yes, you can look at it, it on yeah. Mary TV or, and YouTube even has some of his, you know, people mm. posted. But 
I, I highly, I strongly recommend Mary TV because you, I mean, they have webcams all over Medjugorje. You can be in mm. Medjugorje all you want there. I think if you're just experiencing one experience, one adoration service there, or go to one of, you know, you, you're an adoration mm. and it's, people don't believe, they don't want to believe it's reverent and it is reverent. They don't want to believe that, um, you know, this is, this is the beautiful, uh, love and reverence and, and devotion and um, honor given to the king. I mean, if you ever see the monstrance that they have, it's huge. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so beautiful. But but it, but the prayer, uh, the music uh, all lends itself. It's somewhere in that, you know, the Lord sends peace into the heart of the pilgrim. And between then and, and even during, the, mostly I think during the evening mass, that's when peace really settles mm. the heart. Mm -hmm. And that's the greatest thing that you hear people speak about when they leave there and they come home and they say the peace, I can't describe the peace that I've experienced mm -hmm. in that area. So, um, you know, it's life changing. Uh, and thank God for that. And how many people then for, through that trickle down, you know, uh, are affected by the peace mm -hmm. that this person has experienced. Mm -hmm. You look at how much fruit has come from it. How many people have really gotten themselves deeply, um, involved in the life of the church and you know people starting prayer groups and uh some of the religious orders that have sprung up since then you know and they're in their pious and and they're 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 truthful they're preaching the truth and they're they're teaching the truth um and and this is what the church has been lacking sadly uh we've had a lot of you know a lot of we've been given a lot of poison I hate to say that, yeah. and I don't point a finger at anyone, but there's been a lot of poison. It's destroyed a lot of, a lot of. And soul. I think it's the lack of um, belief in the supernatural that's that has, plays a big part in you yeah. know the crisis of faith at the moment because, you know, the faith is is about believing in what we we don't see, and a lot of that is you know mm -hmm. supernatural. We need that. It's a gift. It's a supernatural gift. Yes. Um, to have faith, and we just lack we lack everything. We lack belief in anything that. It's beyond our understanding, which is really, mm -hmm. that's really it's sad. Been, we've, we've really been desensitized. I think the media mm. has done a horrendous job on the minds of, of people worldwide now, especially mm. you know, now that people have the internet and they have cell phones and, you know, the young people, oh my goodness, if it weren't for Our Lady, what would happen to the young people? But mm. I'm seeing, I'll tell you what I'm seeing right now. And, and I've noticed this like intensely. Our Lady has asked us all these years to pray for unbelievers, and I'm I'm seeing a shift and a change. I mean, we're seeing it in celebrities, right? Who are mm, becoming Catholic. That's right. Yeah. Oh, to, yeah. The I mean, Russell are, Brand alone. I mean, that you look at me. That's that's just crazy. <laughs> phenomenal. It's like, oh my goodness, and how many mm -hmm. others that that we don't know about? I found out about mm -hmm. there's prayer groups in Hollywood now. They have to be underground. They're hiding. They don't want people to know because then not only would they lose their jobs, but, they, you know, it could be even worse for them. So but there are people I know that are um, conducting, the, you know, organizing these prayer groups. And they're saying all these all these people involved in, in the industry are all high incognito coming into these prayer Absolutely. groups. Absolutely. I mean, when you have the largest, you know, the largest person in the world, when you talk about just YouTube, when well, I mean YouTube, when you think about um, Joe Rogan. And he's now been on his mm. podcast. He's the largest podcaster, you know, in the world. And he's talking in his most recent last few months about how the world needs God and yes. how we need Jesus. And he's starting to look at these things. You can oh, see wow. the Holy Spirit beginning to move through these people that before they never would have been moving through. Yeah. Debbie, I found it interesting that you said that, yeah, you're going to Garabandal. And I've heard it said before that Medjugorje and Garabandal, when we talk about the miracle, mm -hmm. that those two are, we're going to see the miracle in both probably in both places, yes. um, you know, at the pines and at the hills. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I think, I, be I believe that's true. I think that, you know, in, in the third secret in Medjugorje is, is the, that there will be an, an, a permanent sign over Apparition Hill that will be indestructible naturally or supernaturally, which means the devil can't get his hands on it, right? right? Obviously, it's going to make, if it's going to make believers out of unbelievers in an instant for thousands and thousands if not millions of souls it's got to be something up in the sky wouldn't you think <laughs> would think so I think, I mean, and if it's in the mm -hmm. sky why wouldn't they see it over the pines god can do that it could be high enough right. 
we don't, we really don't know. I mean, scripture tells us a great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed at the sun, the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. If that can happen, why can't there be an illuminated cross, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't there be uh, something mm -hmm. Eucharistic and Marian? What, I mean, we don't know what mm -hmm. it is exactly, but of course, I, I do think that I, and I, I have no, let's put it this way. One time, Maria, the visionary Maria, they were, uh, Americans were asking over and over again about the secrets, the secrets, the secrets. And, and you know, she finally just, they're not going to talk about it, and they're secrets, right? And mm -hmm. they don't want us to focus on that anyway. But she did say this, if you pray and live the message, you will know everything you need to know. And I believe that I found that to be true in a lot of for in a lot of ways. So I think that no, I've heard a priest say, "If we pray the rosary, we'll need every, we'll know everything we need to know." There you go. And I, and I mean, pray the daily rosary. Yeah. You, know, you think about Sister Luciana from Fatima. Her exact words when they kept pressuring her about the third secret was, "You have the book of the Apocalypse, right? You have the book of Revelation. It's it's all there. Exactly. You don't need yeah. the secret to know. You need to read and study." Mm -hmm. yes. um, so I, I definitely can see that. Yeah. So I, I think that I'm, I would imagine, and, and no one's told me this, and, and I don't have any proof of this. It's just what I think. Um, I would imagine that the warning is one of the first sec two secrets of Medjugorje. I mean, cause mm. that, I mean, that is going to be the greatest act of divine mercy that the world has seen, right? Um, since the death and resurrection of Jesus and the ascension and the and Pentecost, right? Um, and then... By then, then the, then comes the the miracle. So I could be wrong on that. Maybe mm. that's they're two different things. But it just seems like how could that? You know, I mean, God can do whatever God wants to do. He created the universe. But um, I feel I think that they're probably the same. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. No, again, no one has ever spoken those words to me. I don't mm -hmm. discuss secrets with. Um, Mariana, Yvonne, I, when I when I was in Kentucky, had him. He'd stayed at our home uh, several times since we invited him to speak at the conferences. Um, and I've gotten to know Maria, and I would never, in my wildest, I would never dare to ask them about that mm -hmm. because mm. it's just so insignificant right. to the other, yeah. other part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would ask them about the secrets. Now, as far as the miracle and, and about the warning and the miracle, you know, it's coming. And, and one of the visionaries one time said, okay, the first five secrets I believe are in and around, have to do with in and around Medjugorje. The last five are chastisements on the world. The suffering that was to happen from the seventh secret has been removed by God because of the response to Medjugorje in the early days. Beautiful. That, right, and they've told us again and again you can mitigate these. Mm -hmm. Except for number so 10, the tenth secret you can't mitigate. So that would have to be scriptural, wouldn't you think? Mm -hmm. I don't know that, but I I would think that. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to um, spend a lot of time um, trying to speculate. Speculate, yeah. right? Yeah, because it does offend the Lord. It offends the Lord when we are all wrapped up and and worried about mm -hmm. oh this thing, you know. I and honestly. We, we really don't need to know the precise details, do no. we? Why would we even want to? <laughs> you know, but, yeah, I, you know, I know, I know we try to, you know, we try to speculate mm -hmm. and try to think about it. It's, you know, it's probably fun to do, but, but like you said, at the end of the time, end of the world, and <laughs> at the end of the day, we need to recite these things to God yeah. and surrender it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and one at one time, Our Lady said that this is not the end of the time of the end of the world. This is the time of the end of evil in the world. And so we see that the devil has just pulled out all his, everything he can right now. He's so desperate, you know, but that's, that's it. So why, you know, I, I just hope that people, you know, they don't, they'll stop. I know that everybody's worried about, Oh, I've got to store all this food and all. God can take out your storage unit or whatever you're, wherever you're going to store that mm -hmm. in an instant. Like you can't do that. One big thing the blessed mother told us very early on in the eighties Read, dear children, every Thursday and when possible in front of the Blessed Sacrament, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 to 34. You cannot serve two masters, God and money. You will either love one and hate the other or despise one and love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about what you are to eat or drink or use for clothing. And it goes on and on and on. Your Father in heaven knows all mm -hmm. these things. He knows all that you need. Mm -hmm. Seek first his kingship over you his way of holiness and all these things 
will be given you besides. Enough then of worrying about tomorrow. Today has troubles enough of its own. Uh, so now how about that? How about her telling us to do that every th since 1980, what, two, 81, 82, when she first gave us that? Um, are we doing that? And why? what's the message for us there? The message isn't that we should go build storehouses and mm. bunkers. You hear about all these yeah. very wealthy people in their bunkers, you know, with 10 year supply of food. Like, okay, oh, but my father knows everything I need. He knows what, what the birds in the air are doing. He knows every hair on my head. He knows every hair I've lost. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So I, I, I really encourage people just focus on your personal holiness. You'll find great joy in it. This is how you're going to attract people to Christ. It sure won't be fear-monging. It sure isn't mm -hmm. going to be focusing on everything dark and gloomy, right? And focusing on evil. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on evil. Focus on the light of Christ. Focus on our, the fact that we have a blessed mother who loves us. Dear, you know, Yvonne asked her one time, but how is it that you're so beautiful? You couldn't hardly look at her. She said, I'm beautiful because I love, dear children. And you also can be beautiful if you love. So, oh, lovely. so, you know, don't we want to attract people to Christ, not to not to turn them away. We don't want to hurt them. We don't want to see anyone in hell. So we, so do everything beautiful and positive in your life to bring people to Christ. That doesn't mean compromising on the truth, but there is a way to do it. You know, there's a way to do it. It starts with prayer and, and be prayerful and prayed up. That's that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's, yeah. that's amazing. Growing up, I grew up in the 70s and, you know, everybody was doing whatever they wanted to do and being told it was okay. One time I went to confession to a priest at school and he asked me if I thought I was there, if I, if what I had done was sinful and, and I didn't, I mean, I don't know, I was out with my friends, I don't know. And I said, no, I, I didn't think so or I wouldn't have done it. <clears throat> so he said, okay, well, what are you doing this weekend? Like he wouldn't reflect on it. Mm. In fact, I don't think there was even absolution. Mm -hmm. and oh, no. so it was kind of a very crazy, crazy mixed up time. But in mm. my heart, and always from when I was little, I have I pray my prayers. I loved I loved the fact that Jesus was always with me. I loved that he had a mother that was beautiful, you know, someone we should aspire to be like. <clears throat> but then I strayed very far from that. So when I had children, I started having children, you know, you get real serious about things, but God was always important in my life, but I didn't understand sin and its consequences. So I, you know, it was an era of great confusion in the seventies and then, and then into the eighties. When I had, uh, you know, I was starting to go through a spiritual awakening. I'd moved from Memphis to, um, Michigan for a short, short time to Mississippi after that, but then we moved to Kentucky. But while we we're in Mississippi, I had an experience. Um, I, I received something in the mail that I, I, I didn't understand. And it was uh, later we came to find out it was um, American Needs Fatima. And they'd send those big magazines in the mail to people. They were kind of oversized and it was all about Fatima. And I was paralegal in a big law firm. And I went to, uh, work the next day and I shared an office with pretty much the only other Catholic. There were four Catholics in the firm and I shared an office, the other Catholic paralegal and I had the same office. And I'm like, Teresa, look at this. Are we, I thought we weren't supposed to believe in this anymore. She said, yeah, we're not supposed to believe in that anymore. Like we didn't, we didn't know. I mean, we mm -hmm. didn't know how to pray the rosary anymore. We didn't, we didn't, we just, the church had changed and it was changing. Mm -hmm. And so was really, you know, that was odd. But after that, uh, it was within a week or two, I received a Reader's Digest. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Reader's Digest, but mm. yes. back then. Yeah, the absolutely. Day, there, you know, people would read them. I, would, I used to read them cover to cover. And I'm mm -hmm. reading Reader's Digest, and I turn the page. And I have it. It's stored away, but I still have that Reader's Digest. And the title of the article was something like A Light Shines in a Village. And I'm reading it. And I didn't realize at all that this could be possible, that it would happen in my lifetime. That here they're saying the Blessed Mother is appearing in this little village in Yugoslavia, communist Yugoslavia, to six children. I knew immediately 
the very moment I read it, I knew it was true. I was, I, I, I was so overcome with joy. I couldn't, I couldn't contain myself. So the next morning when I went to work, I brought that with me and I made an appointment with my parish priest who I was always intimidated to talk to other people, especially somebody like a priest back then. And I, um, I made an appointment. He saw me that evening and I said, I showed him the article and I said, father, why isn't the church telling us about this is the most exciting, amazing thing happening in the world. And he said, we don't believe in that anymore. Don't, don't pay attention to that. So right then I knew, okay, uh, this is, this is not, mm. yeah, this, this poor priest. That's really how I felt. Mm. And he was a priest from Ireland. And, you know, I, I just thought he really, he, uh, poor guy. <laughs> and so for me to even think that about a priest, I thought, you know, I shouldn't think that way, but I did. I, I just felt bad for him that his faith was mm. not, you know, he didn't, he couldn't believe that. So within six weeks, we had gotten transferred to another city and I was living in Louisville, Kentucky. And I enrolled my daughter in school and I would go at night and sit in the chapel because I was starting to experience something that I didn't even know that was possible. And it'd be this flame in my heart and the fire just was burning. And I would go and well, ask- All of this is just coming from your reading of that uh, Reader's Digest magazine. Yes. That's amazing. It's me. Wow. And, and, the, and, and so it was the Lord calling and it was Our Lady, I think, igniting my heart on, you know, I, the Holy Spirit. It was like, I couldn't get mm. enough. I wanted to be in the church. I wanted to read the scriptures. They started to open up and become alive to me. And this is where I believe that the Lord was giving me an infusion of grace, um, maybe for the mission that he had for me to do. Um, and I know that he has this, he has a mission for each one of us to do. And for me, I'm coming to this awareness. And I, when I'm coming to this awareness, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I have been so slow. And, and this is what everybody else is experiencing. This is their life. And oh, where have I been? How could I have been so blind to this? And later then I came to realize that, no, it was a special grace because people weren't mm. understanding and, and as joyous, as joyful as I was <laughs> feeling about everything to do with the Lord, the world, the people. I, I was just in love with every, every aspect of life and of living. Uh, had, I'd always had from, from my childhood a very, very, very deep love and respect for the priesthood. I don't know how or why, but I always did. So I was respectful to priests and people and now this now we're in the 80s, right? And people would make fun of me and just tell me to grow up because priests are real men, are real people too. And, not, mm. and I'm like, yes, but they're still, he's still a priest. He's still, a rep, you know, he's representing Christ. There's something more. His hands have been ordained. Ours haven't. And, you know, I, I caught a lot of flack for that, but it, it didn't matter to me because I knew that the priest is very important. I come to find out later, many, many years later, as Miriana tells us, the priest is the bridge to the triumph of her immaculate heart. Wow. wow. So, wow. Uh, you know, the, the role of priest, it's like, okay, yes, you might be a man, but you're something else. You're, there is something very special um, because you can forgive sins and you can consecrate the bread, the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. No other person mm -hmm. has that power on earth to do that. So that happened, and I, I would go into the church while uh, my daughter would be at some maybe practice or something, volleyball practice or something, and I, I would sit in the church and wait for her. I'd go early so I could sit in the church and be close to Jesus in the tabernacle. And this one particular night, I heard the priest locking the doors, and I was a little sad because I thought, he didn't even come in and say goodnight to you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Like, I was really starting to have... A, a true relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I would speak to him and it didn't matter. I knew he was there and he was listening and I knew that maybe he was speaking to me, but I didn't hear or always understand maybe what he was saying, but I knew that he, I knew he was there just as surely as I can see you both. Right. And um, mm -hmm. I was pouring out my love for him. And as I've said this to people that I know, I'm like, when you fall in love with someone, you want to know everything about them. You want to tell them mm -hmm. everything about you. And so with Jesus, I was 
just, I wanted, I want to know everything. So I'm reading the scriptures, I'm going to mass and, and I was sitting with him in front of the, you know, blessed sacrament. And this one particular night I said, Lord, I would do, Lord Jesus, I would do anything for you, anything. I, I just, I love you and I will do anything. And, and there is a stillness there. And I heard in my heart so deeply and so profoundly, he said, I would like you to do something for me. And I'm like, anything, anything. I was always so eager and I'm ready to dive off the cliff, you know, before he says jump. <laughs> I was jumping. It was yeah. really, you know, I, was, I was so, and I look back now and I can say it was very childlike. Um, but at the time I didn't know. I just, so it was just so pure. And he, he's, and when he said to me, um, what he said to me, I knew then our relationship had gone to a new level because when someone you're falling in love with says this to you, you know that they're serious. And Jesus said to me, I'd like you to meet my mother. And oh. my whole, I was like, I, I just, I, it was like I had just fallen into this big ocean of love, you know, when I heard that. Mm -hmm. And the next morning I went to mass. I didn't know how, I didn't know what he meant, you know, how this was going to mm. happen, but it just started to unfold. And I went to mass and, and I would be the only dark haired person in the church. And, and I hadn't lived there very long. So people didn't know me. I didn't know them. And a lady, an older lady came up to me and she said, after mass, and she said, honey, I know you don't know me, but I really think you should have this book. And she gives me, I believe it was the gray book. Um, which was one of the very first books that came out in English. And it was the homilies of the priests from Medjugorje. And I couldn't, I thought, I mean, what a treasure, right? I almost cried. I might've cried. I don't know. Cause. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the next day, the same thing happened. Another lady came up to me and said, honey, I know you don't know me, but I think, I think you should have this book. And she gives me the gold book of prayers which were prayers that were given that um, that included many of the Medjugorje prayers. And as it went on that whole week, I'm getting, I'm compiling a library from all these people who <laughs> I don't know and they don't know me, <laughs> handing me these books saying, I think you should. And so I became a sponge. You know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have cell phones. There was no way to really get information except through maybe your, um, you know, when you get the weekly uh, newspaper from your diocese or, you know, you, or newspaper. I don't know. I would just find ways of finding things. You get a book and you go, oh, let me see who the publisher is and get in touch with them. Whatever it took, I just wanted more. And then I start getting newsletters from different um, peace centers. And so eventually I wound up um, being invited to Medjugorje and I I, my, it was actually an invitation from my father after some other miraculous things that happened that led up to this. And my parents weren't, it was not the kind of thing they would do to just say to one of us grown children, oh, I'd like to send you to Europe. <laughs> they just didn't do that. <laughs> and, but, but my dad was very persistent. And I kept saying, I don't have to go. My rosaries were turning gold. My medals were turning gold. People would were starting to invite me to come to their prayer group or come to their home or come to their parish or to their youth group and give talks on Medjugorje. And so I was could, this while you were at Medjugorje? I was they, at home. I had your, never been to Medjugorje. Yeah. Where you're, was, when your um, rosaries were turning gold? They turned gold in my hand at home in Kentucky. Oh, I thought, yeah. while you were at Medjugorje. Okay. Yeah. My hand was burning one day and I'm, I opened it and I'm like, my rosary turned gold. Like, I, And it was so natural, uh, an event that I, I just, I was so thankful for it, but I, I found myself more on my knees, you know, thanking God for mm -hmm. that. He would give me a gift like that. Um, and thanking our lady more than I was just like mesmerized by the gold rosary. I was really, um, I just kept seeing the giver of the gift and I, and I'm very grateful to God for that grace that he gave me that that my focus was really, really deeply on him. And I find, and so when I did go to Medjugorje, the third time my dad told me that, I heard my heavenly father say, I want you to go to Medjugorje. So <clears throat> I went to Medjugorje and it was absolutely, there's nothing that can describe my first pilgrimage to Medjugorje. It was um, 1989 and it was very, it was still a little primitive there. It wasn't as um, current, you know, as it is now. Mm. Um, 
but I had so many beautiful experiences and I had, and I didn't know anybody on the pilgrimage. Uh, again, I hadn't lived there that long. So I, I just didn't know anybody, but it was like, I knew our lady and I knew her son. And I felt so wrapped up in this. The beauty I think of Medjugorje for me at that moment was I cry. I was finding myself getting weepy because I was going to leave. I knew I was going to have to leave there. You know, I had two children. I was married. I had a family. Um, and I, I just, I didn't want to leave. And I love my kids. I didn't, I was like, I don't want to leave the, um, but I, I wonder, I, I went on apparition Hill the night before I left. I'm like, <clears throat> I don't understand why I feel this way and why I'm so sad, but I really, I'm so sad to leave. And I, and I really interiorly heard you're, you're sad because this is your home and it's your home because your mother is here. And that moment I realized that the entire pilgrimage, I was, I was focused on the Lord and the church and all that that means being focused on the church, you know, the sacraments, mm -hmm. the mass, the mm -hmm. profession, uh, the beauty of, and treasure house of our church. Um, but I was experiencing all of it in a mother's arms. And, and that's Medjugorje. You, you know, Our Lady calls us in Medjugorje to something and she calls each person on earth. The invitation is given, it's extended to the world. You know, when she said, I am the queen of peace. The king of peace has sent me to help you. Wow. Those words resounded in my whole being. And I thought, Jesus sent her to help us. In 1981, we're scratching our heads like, what do we need help with? Because we didn't even realize how far gone we already were mm -hmm. in the world and, and yeah. you know, and the things that we had been taught. And um, so, so after that, after that happened, um, I, I was just like, oh, I see, you know, and I knew I had to go back home. And again, let me go back to the fact that Our Lady, when she has extended this invitation, she gives a message to the world on the 25th of every month. Most people in the world don't know about that. Um, you know, uh, 50 some million people have been to Medjugorje. They know that there's a message. How many people are responding to that from, from their experience there? I have no idea. I know that it has transformed the majority of, of people who I've taken there, I've, it's transformed their lives. But one thing I tell my pilgrims uh, about that is the Blessed Mother has said, I, I need you. You are part of my plan. So I pray that for the grace to understand her plan and my role in it. And I really encourage people in my pilgrims to do the very same thing because you come to realize that no matter what, if you're going to be confined to bed, if you're confined to home, if you're, you know, confined like the young mothers or the mothers with kids who are teenagers or whatever age, you know, people think, oh, I'm just so busy with all of this. What can I do? You can be a good mother or a good father. You can be a good parent um, and teach your children the things that they need to know and help them be part of their lives and not negligent. You can, um, you know, if you're a priest, I mean, how many priests have gone to Medjugorje mm -hmm. and said, my priesthood has been restored and it happened in the confessional. Pope John Paul II wow. called Medjugorje the confessional of the world. I mean, that's so beautiful to think about that. Um, we have, you know, so when people start to realize my life has meaning and there's somebody who's watching out for me, and let me just abandon myself to that. Let me consecrate myself to that. Let me give myself to that. Then the church starts to change. Um, the world around us changes. And uh, for me, the world, you know, from my world, just in living Our Lady's messages, I mean, there was so much depth and meaning to my life that I hadn't had before. You know, I wasn't floundering. I wasn't like, well, what am I supposed to do today? You know, what? Am I? It's like, no, I started having direction and, and purpose and realizing that, you know, God exists and he loves me and he wants me to share that love with everyone that I know and I meet. So I hear a lot of people, you know, saying, oh, the world is so gloomy and dark and terrible and evil. And it's like, that's not the world that we're talking about here. If we keep our eyes focused on the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, which is close at hand, 
they, this should just ignite us with like <laughs> motivation and drive, <laughs> right? Because our lady, okay. her, her triumph is coming. And there's pretty good evidence that it might have something to do with the blessed sacrament, <laughs> might have mm. something to do with the reign <laughs> of the sacred and Eucharistic heart of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And because we're seeing so many people now that are, are coming into the church and they're coming in because of the Eucharist and they can't have that somewhere else because because it's true. We, you know, it is true in the Roman Catholic Church. It is true that we have the Holy Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And in Medjugorje, I think you experience the that in a whole different way. Um, the focus there is so centered on the Eucharist. It's so centered on prayer. Um, it's centered on the Holy Mass. And I I think it just teaches people. Going to Medjugorje, you learn how to pray unceasingly because you, it just becomes a way in your walk. It's a way of life. And they live that way of life in Medjugorje. And even if there are, you know, are pockets of people here, you know, people are people. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, and, and Medjugorje has grown a lot since, uh, since the early days. And I think with the Italians and the Americans getting there, we've brought a lot of... Um, maybe distraction because we want, so the Italians like the beauty. So they built a lot of like big <laughs> hotels and, <laughs> um, and the Americans, we wanted comfort. So we brought uh, central air conditioning and heat. And um, I don't know about Australians. I don't know, but, but, <laughs> but I know what we do. And, you know, we want, we, we're so used to convenience mm. and maybe that's not such a good thing because um, their way of life has always just been so admirable to see mm -hmm. that you can live a, a life, a rich life, a full life with, you don't have to have all the trappings. I mean, the people at the time, I mean, back then there were a lot of people there that were just mm -hmm. peasants. And I don't mean this out of any disrespect at all. In fact, I respect them greatly for everything that they suffered. And yet look at how beautiful their faith was so much so that our lady chose that land for, you know, for her apparitions. So after, you know, after I got back from Medjugorje, that first experience, they, uh, the group that I went with asked me, the man said, well, I'm not going to be able, I don't want, I'm not going to do this. We want you to come and, and help us. We want you to like be one of the guide, you know, take groups over. Mm. And I'm like, I could never do that. And they're like, you can do that. Yeah. We've heard from all the pilgrims that you can do that. <laughs> because I didn't wow. know, but to be, I, I was this dried sponge and I became saturated. And then what do you mm -hmm. have to do with that? Like the scripture says, it is impossible for us to refrain from speaking about what we have seen and heard. You know, so going back, that that was 1989. So soon after, that, the next pilgrimage, they're like, please lead this group. And so I, I started going back until the, um, they left. The, the guy was retired. You know, he just he couldn't do it anymore. And he said, I'm going to dissolve this organization and you just take just do something. Well, I did. I started Marion Center and um, opened up a shop there, you know, a, a, like a, the first thing we built there was a chapel. And um, before you know it, there's people that want to help and volunteer. And I felt in my heart this strong desire to invite the certain priest to come and talk. I, again, I, you know, it wasn't my home. It was not like, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, well, I'll do it. So I, I asked a, another woman to pray and fast with me for nine days to see what our lady wanted us to do with this priest when he came. Cause again, I did. So they, where was the chapel? This was, in, this was in um, Louisville, Kentucky. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so we prayed and fasted and I just kept hearing conference, have a conference, have a conference. I didn't know what a conference was. I had never been to a conference. I didn't know. And then I, I started realizing, Oh, there have conferences. What is a conference? I don't know. But I just thought, well, why don't we invite a few more people to speak and have some music and we'll have mass and get some priests. And, and before you know it, we put on this, it was a long, it was a conference. It was very beautiful. So kind of set the stage. That was when I um, started, I had all these books and everything that were piling up in my uh, basement in my garage. So I'm like, I have, I, I have a family here. I can't keep it here. And so we opened up uh, a Marion center and that was another, you know, that came about in a very beautiful way. How, 
Our Lady got what Our Lady wanted. Uh, so we had a storefront there. I was offered a um, job here in St. Augustine, Florida, and I talked to Father Michael Scanlon, who was the president of the university, but by now, by that time now, he was chancellor. I got to be pretty close to him. And um, he told me, yes, you must go. You're being sent. I'm like, oh, how do you leave Steubenville? It's like, how do you leave Medjugorje? How do you leave Steubenville? Um, but one thing I did learn while I was in Steubenville, I think I even learned it before. I think when Our Lady set my heart on fire, or the Holy Spirit, but you know, they come together. Um, I, I was like, okay, if the Lord says do it, we're going to do it. We're not going to question it. We're just going to go with it. You know, that became real easy for me. And I know it's not an easy thing for a lot of people. Um, and that again is another grace. So none of this I did on my own, I can assure you, because I would have, I would have just mutilated it. It would have been bad, but I'm here. I was here for many years and I'm like, I, I was dropping miraculous medals all over the place thinking, well, where am I going to do this? Where are we going to do this? And I had no idea. So I got a phone call or an email or something from someone who asked me, they said, you know, I'd like to put together a pilgrimage to Medjugorje and I don't know how to do it. I've been there only once. And I'm wondering if you could help me with that. Would you like to kind of be like the group leader and put this together? And I'm like, sure, I would do it. I, because I, at that moment, I felt it in my heart deeply. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. So it wound up that everyone on that pilgrimage were people that I knew from my past, you know. There, were, there was a priest in, in Indiana and uh, a lot of people that just got on board. And this time, though, I'm there and I thought, well, I'm not going to know it. Nobody's going to recognize me. It'll be all right. I just, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going, I'm coming down Apparition Hill. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I see one of the guides that I knew way back when. And I didn't even know she knew me. But she just yells out my name. <laughs> Debbie. She remembered she, you. She remembered me. And she came up and hugged me. And she said, you know, you're supposed to be bringing people to Medjugorje again. And I'm like, well, I had this group. I'm doing it for someone else. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know how. I had a full-time job. You know, I'm like, I, yeah, I wish. <laughs> the next day, I'm going up cross mountain and a guide comes up to me and says, Debbie, you know, you're supposed to be bringing people to Medjugorje again. And I'm like, what? And the next day I, I'm in front of St. James church. We're getting ready to take a group picture or something. We're right in front mm -hmm. of the church. And one of the guides from the very beginning sees me. I thought she was going <laughs> to, she was going to pick me up. She drops her bag. She comes up and hugs me and says, Debbie, you know, you're supposed to be bringing people to Medjugorje again. Wow. That was three. I heard it on Apparition Hill, on Cross Mountain, and in front of St. James Church. I mean, that's Medjugorje, right? So, yeah. like, maybe. The next day, <laughs> I'm meeting with a friend of mine. <laughs> she said, so, you're bringing people to Medjugorje again, are you? And I said, well, it looks that way. It looks that way. I I, I don't know how it's going to happen, but it does look like that's that's my job. That's what I'm going to do. And so, um, she said, Hold, are you sure? I said, yeah. She said, hold on, blah, blah, blah. She gets on the phone and she says, okay, come and see me tomorrow after you leave. Um, after you leave Chinoclo, because we I was taking my grip up to Chinoclo and she lived right over there. And uh, I went knocking at her door and she's grabbing her jacket and I'm like, I thought I was going to come in and meet your family and, and hang out. And, <laughs> you know, and she takes me uh, next door, basically, and introduced me to Miriana and her, hus her husband and we're talking for a little bit and he goes, so one moment and he leaves and comes back with his, um, his uh, calendar. And he says, what, what dates would you like next year? <laughs> like somebody pinched me, this could be happening. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't try for it to happen. I didn't try mm -hmm. to make it. And I wasn't trying to emulate somebody else. I was just mm -hmm. like, I was shocked. I couldn't it believe it. just all it. happened for you. <laughs> you didn't have to do much. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Right. I just like showed up. <laughs> and so, <laughs> <Showed> <laughs> So uh, the next thing you know, I mean, I've, I've gotten a beautiful relationship with uh, Miriana and, and Marco, her husband. Mm. We do stay there. <clears throat> Sometimes if it's they have big crowds there, we stay across the street at Yakov's. Um, but it's it was a moment. Do they have like um, a place for people to stay inside their home? Yes, they have. Oh, uh, wow. They've added on to their home. So they're like little retreat centers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you have your room with, you know, 
one, two or three beds in it, the private bathroom, which is really nice. Again, Americans like that kind of stuff. Remember when we, <laughs> I remember when we were there and they, everybody shared a bathroom. So it was, it's, it was very nice. Um, and it's just a beautiful, we have a beautiful experience there. And there's a few other things that we do that, you know, a lot of groups don't get to do and I, nothing that I planned, but it all mm. just unfolded before me. So I was very grateful, you know, and I'm, I continue to be very grateful. I, I've, um, my whole family have been there, uh, except for one, one of the children who wasn't born yet. <laughs> so I yeah. have 13 grandchildren. I have two children, oh, wow. 13 grandchildren, two amazing in-law, you know, my son-in-law and daughter-in-law are, mm -hmm. they're like my kids. I, I just... I'm so blessed by that. Um, I would like to say that I don't deserve any of this. There is nothing in my life I did that would have made me deserve this. Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful life. Now, um, you, and you said glad. in one of your in your interview with Tom of Medjugorje that you were born for Medjugorje, and I guess I was, that's the reason I, why. Eh? Mm -hmm. I, be I believe that with all my heart. I believe that this is the purpose of my life, and you mm. know, everyone has their purpose. And I do encourage people, please pray to understand what your role in Our Lady's plan is, because every single human being has a role, including you guys. Uh, you know, Our Lady has, has, she needs us. She said that. I mean, we know in heaven they really don't need us, but Our Lady needs us. We have to bring mm -hmm. peace, salt, and light to the world. And we can't do that if we're down and depressed and talking bad about people and, you know, so just true. find the fault and criticize yeah, absolutely. our poor priests and you know, and I, I would like to say this, that Our Lady said in the early days, um, the bishop was all about, he loved the fact that Our Lady was appearing there in, in Mostar. <clears throat> he loved it when he heard that Our Lady was appearing. And, you know, Father Yozo was away giving a retreat. And he, he did not love hearing about it because he mm -hmm. didn't believe it. <clears throat> the bishop believed it. And the bishop, when he, you know, they were threatened with imprisonment and torture things kind of changed and, and their opinion shifted after Father Yoso had um, an experience with Jesus in the tabernacle and Jesus told him, protect the children. And so he ran outside and then the children were running up going, Father, protect us. We're, the police are after us. And so he brought them into the mm -hmm. sacristy. He went back outside. The police came running up. Have you seen the children? And he said, yes. And they just kept running, thinking that the children ran past him. But now he knew that this was true. So he was imprisoned and tortured. The bishop, on the other hand, was Wow. And so the bishop, yes, and so the bishop, people were criti very critical of the bishop because he changed his views. He said, no, it's not true. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. And people were really, you know, criticizing the bishop and the Blessed Mother said, do not, cr do not criticize or condemn the bishop. He is part of my plan. Pray for him. Wow. Mm -hmm. He was part, he's part of her plan. So we don't understand any anything that's going on. God is in complete control. And sometimes and, God allows things to happen for a greater purpose, right? Yes. And doesn't he always? Mm -hmm. He always does. If we cooperate rather than rebel, we're going to be a lot better off. We're, we're, you know, we might have to suffer, but it's not going to be that kind of intense. It's like, redemptive suffering most redemptive. of the time. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yes. So um, soon after, uh, you know, when the Lord said I was going to open up a center here kind of thing, um, I didn't, this is an historic town. This is the oldest city in the United States. Um, from 1565, the Feast of St. Augustine, they spotted land, and that's how we got our name. They landed on September 8th, which is the nativity of Our Lady's birth, right? Her, and so it was almost like the Lord gave her um, a whole nation as a birthday gift. Um, and 34 years before that, Our Lady appeared to Juan Diego in Mexico as a pregnant mother a pregnant royal mother and when they landed here they had uh, a statue with them of a new devotion in spain our lady of la leche and mm -hmm. Juan Pardo, good our lady of the milk and good delivery so in mexico our lady is pregnant but they come here with the statue same color our lady of good delivery <laughs> and she is has given birth and she's nursing her baby as you can see, I think wow. I have a statue back here somewhere of her. Is that what the, is that the painting too, Debbie, yes, that's behind you? Right. Is that Lalice? Yes. Mm -hmm. So oh, this is, this is like, okay, this is a very beautiful, uh, John F. Kennedy, two weeks before he was assassinated, called this America's most sacred acre. 16 Native Americans were martyred here. And uh, so they became, it became the first colony because the Native Americans saw what reverence was happening 
Um, when they got off the ship, they knelt down and kissed a crucifix that the Franciscan priest had held out. And then they went and had mass at the place that we, we call the rustic altar here. Uh, that was the first mass here. The Native Americans saw this reverence. They were worshiping a great spirit. So they asked them to stay. And that's why they didn't go exploring any further. They stayed here. So this became the first colony. Um, and the uh, first parish is here, the Cathedral uh, of St. Augustine. And the name St. Augustine came from the fact that that was the day they spotted land, August 28th on his feast day. So that's how we have our, our name, mm -hmm. St. Augustine. And, this, and the, it's really kind of beautiful because the county is called St. John's County. The little island over there that a lot of people live on is called St. Anastasia Island. So it was very Catholic um, in the beginning. Um, here in the United uh -huh. States. And the first Thanksgiving actually took place here. So a lot of people don't know that. So I feel like, wow, right? And, that, and, and I'm pointing that way because <laughs> I'm literally on the grounds in this little shop. I went to adoration one, mm. um, I'd go to mass at the cathedral and adoration for an hour and I'd pass here every day on my way to work. And one day I saw this building, which was uh, as I said, I was throwing miraculous medals in all these buildings all over <laughs> all over town, but not here because this was, there's no way, you know, in my mind, there was no way this would ever be available. And <clears throat> anyway, I saw a sign, but there was a guy riding me, my tail and I couldn't stop. And I saw a sign in the window and I'm like, wow. And then I went to adoration, I went to mass and adoration the next morning and something kept sh shaking me saying, go look at that sign. So I came back and I looked, nobody was on the road pushing me. And I saw the sign and um, said for rent. And I called immediately. And I mean, and through a series of miraculous mm -hmm. events, it mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And I signed papers on July 16th, Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Um, the Marion Center when I had in Kentucky, I'd signed those papers unknowingly that I, it, I didn't even plan it that day, March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation. So I see Our Lady's mm -hmm. hand, right? in all of this. So this shop here is called the Blue Mantle and it is what Our Lady wanted. And we opened on November 21st, the Feast of the Presentation of Mary um, 2019, which was just a couple mm -hmm. months before COVID. Um, and I'm like, Lord, this is your lady, your mother's, and you wanted it for her. You're going to have to help help us get through this. You know, we got through it. We were closed for like seven weeks, but I was doing a lot of shipping out mm -hmm. of here. And the Lord just provided, and I, I, I didn't have to worry about it. I've never had, I've never worried about it. And here I am, as I said. And you, and you named the um, organization Triumph Pilgrimages? So let me tell you and about there's, that. <laughs> there's a story behind that, isn't there? <laughs> this was something else. Okay. In, in October of 2018, I, all right, after that pilgrimage, where I, where they're telling me you're going to, you know, bring, so I'm, I signed up with Marco to get, uh, you know, the dates, August 15th, because we always came on the mm -hmm. Feast of the Assumption before. And then um, uh, and then September 14th, I wanted to be there for the Triumph of the Cross. So I'm, I'll do those two. I thought, all right, in 2019, I'll find a way to get off work and I'm going to do those. So I, I was like, okay, I've got to come up with a name. And I was talking to a friend of mine in South Bend and we came up with a name. I'm like, okay, this, I have, I got an idea. So I ran to adoration and I knelt down and I'm like, okay, Lord, I was exhausted. I really was. And I'm like, Lord, mm -hmm. here's the name. And I see in my mind's eye, I see it big as can be N O apostrophe. And I was crushed. I was like, <laughs> oh Lord, what have I got? I, I have nothing left. And at that moment I was like in an IMAX theater. It felt like it. Mm -hmm. And I saw from left to right triumph pilgrimages. And I'm like, Oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> Jesus, you can't, that's too big of a name. That name has to go to, it's just, I'm naming them off all these people who have already had their own companies, right? The big companies. And, and I'm like, they they deserve it. We're waiting for the triumph Lord. This is way too, this is too big. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd outsmart the Lord. And I, I went home and, and you have to get on and you have to go on to look for it. You have to go through your state to see if a name has been used. And yeah, I yeah. put in all the information and, and it's asking me more and more questions. I'm like, I just want to know if the name is being used. Cause I thought I was going to have a problem, right? <laughs> and, and I, and I, hit, I hit, you know, sent, you know, submit or whatever. 
And Bing, it says, it gives me all this information with a number. And then Bing, I get an email and it's the IRS giving me an EIN number. So it was like, well, it looks like Triumph Pilgrimages is it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't think so you, I thought, you know, so. Unwittingly um, registered unwittingly, the company. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I had 101 people um, mm. for the 40th anniversary. I had groups before that, but, um, and obviously since, but it was just glorious. It's been so beautiful. Kelly, did you have any further questions before we wrap up? I don't think so. Though you did mention a dream that we were going to touch on, but I don't know if <laughs> yes, we're going to touch on dream. that today or not. No, no, no. St. Charbel dream. Yes. Yes, yes. You saw the picture in my back. I did. I saw the picture in your background. I was like, wait a minute. We talked about that. <laughs> wait a minute. I've got him on right here. My pilgrims mm -hmm. in, in last April, they gave me this mm -hmm. um, after they heard about the fact that St. Charbel came to me in a dream. And, and again, it had to do with prayer. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was asking the Lord for something and that had to do with prayer. And um, St. Charbel came to me and it was so real. I know I was sleeping, but it was, it was very, mm, and I felt his mm -hmm. hands over my hands and he was praying with me, you know, and then a couple of things that I don't, I'm not going to talk about, but um, mm -hmm. I, I just, he is like the most prolific saint in the history of the church. Like no other saint has as many miracles attributed to them as St. Mm. Chardell. And so uh, people don't even, you know, didn't even know who he was. You know, I, you see him all over Medjugorje. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every <laughs> shop has some, has a St. Charbel section. And I think wow. you know, Lebanese people go there and, and they've really, yeah. it's become a beautiful thing. The other thing is there, there are many Eastern Europeans now that are there. Um, uh, many, many, many. At one time, I was there. Thirty-five hundred Ukrainians were there. I mean, it was wow. ma amazing to really? see. Really, wow. one group of thirty-five hundred. Yes, and the Roma uh, of Ukrainians. Then you have Russians. You have Romanians. You have Hungarians. You have Czech. I have Polish. Oh my goodness, beautiful Polish people, and their deep faith and their strong warrior-like faith. Mm -hmm. Boy, I'll tell you what. Those guys put a lot of our, uh, a lot of us to shame. They are just, man, they are, they're ready. They are so ready. Our Lady's Army, it's just oh, yeah. so big and beautiful. And we're all, all invited to her army, aren't we? And um, I want to just, maybe if we could finish off with this, that you you mentioned in one of your previous interviews that our, Lord, our Lady is calling everyone to Medjugorje, and it's an invitation to the whole world to visit Medjugorje. Can you yes. talk about, about the importance of that and yes. how that can bring about her triumph? Yes, yes. Um, I think because there are particular graces that you receive in Medjugorje. You know, again, at the be very beginning of my story, it was like, oh, I don't have to go there because it's already happening for me here. Like, not that I was looking yeah. for something to happen, but I knew. But it was like, no, you have to go there. And then when you go there and you experience something you've never experienced in, in your life, you experience a, a, a level of peace that you didn't know was even possible and love and joy and brotherhood and community, you know, you, the church, I mean, the great love for the church, the great love for the passion of Christ. You know, when you climb cross mountain, you, you cannot help but realize what Jesus did for us. Um, so I think, you know, when the late, when our lady invites us, she's not just inviting the Catholics or she's not even just inviting the, you know, some certain percentage of Catholics who believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. She's not only inviting um, people who know how to pray the rosary. Mm, she's looking for, you know, those lost sheep in her, her son's fold and, and she's mother. And so she's made extended an invitation to the world and it's up to each one of us to RSVP. I have mm -hmm. told people that the um, only people I know that wanted to go to Medjugorje that didn't go, were those who said, I can't, oh, I can't, I can't get off work. Oh, I can't, my husband won't like it. Oh, I can't, I don't have the money. I mean, our father in heaven is rich. You can't worry about the money because God has get, got, has that under control. And a lot of people will tell you, I went to Medjugorje and I have no money. How did that happen? Um, because either somebody paid their way and they and gave it to them as a gift, or they wound up getting a check in the mail that from an insurance thing from 20 years ago that they didn't know. I mean, it happens. Miracles happen all the time. So Our Lady is calling you. She's calling each and every one of you to Medjugorje. In your heart, respond to her. And if you want to go there, and you, you, you just ask Our Lady, bless Mother, please help me get there. I think you're calling me to Medjugorje. I know you're calling me to Medjugorje. Please help me to get there. 
I want to respond to your call. And if you can't somehow or another find a way to do that, at least do the five things that she's asking us to do. And that is daily prayer of the rosary. She is asking us to fast twice a week and from something on Wednesday and Friday for her intentions. She's asking us to read the scriptures to get to know her son. She's asking us to um, go to monthly confession, at least monthly confession, and to receive the Holy Eucharist in a state of grace as often as you can. So don't wait just for Sundays. Do it every, every day if you can. You can find a way to do it because most places have masses, you know, early morning masses for people who work. Sometimes there are evening masses. You know, go, go more than once a week. Go twice until you build it up. And then you won't be able to live without receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. That is what Amen. I yeah. God bless you. We've got to get going. But Debbie, we want to um, hear from you while you're at um, Garabandar. Yeah. Are you going to send us, are you going to do a video call and we can post it on our channel? Absolutely. Let's, let's do that. Let's organize that. that let's that'll be awesome. That. Okay. I'm going to bring my right. everything I need. So let's do it. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Debbie. And thanks a lot, Kelly, for joining us. Thank you, Ron. Until next time, everyone. Thank May you, God Debbie. bless you all. Take God care. God bless you. Thanks. Bless you.